priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all of his house. You know, concerning Moses, the great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said, he was mighty in word as well as deed, and this psalm we believe to be one of his weighty utterances, worthy to stand side by side with his glorious oration recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses was peculiarly a man of God and God's man, chosen of God, inspired of God, honored of God, and faithful to God in all his house. He well deserved the name which is here given him. Psalm chapter 90, beginning with verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood, they are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins of the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finished our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to, your cho to their children, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. A lot of people today are experiencing hardship as a result of this coronavirus pandemic, and we all know that to be the case. Some are experiencing financial hardship, financial challenges as a result of this pandemic. A number of people have lost their jobs. Last week we saw that over 3 million Americans filed for unemployment. We've never had numbers like that in the United States before. Now, of course, the stimulus package that was passed on Friday, I think is going to help a little bit with that. But the economic future of the United States of America is uncertain. Some are experiencing financial challenges. Others are experiencing emotional challenges, having to be holed up in their homes for such a significant period of time and having to practice social distancing and just the whole not knowing uh, what's going to happen in the, in the future with this coronavirus. Is it going to get dramatically worse? Is it going to get dramatically worse in Michigan? Is one of my family members uh, going to get infected? Am I going to get infected? As a result of this pandemic, some are experiencing financial challenges, others are experiencing emotional challenges, and of course, so many are experiencing physical challenges. A number of people have, in fact, been infected with this virus, and as we all know, a number of people have passed away as a result. And yet, if we can be positive just for a moment and see a silver lining in all of this, the coronavirus has the capacity 
to remind us of certain important realities which we find in this glorious song. We want to talk about these realities. And reality number one is the eternality of God. The eternality of God. Look again with me, if you will, at the opening two verses. O Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Folks, there is a being in the universe who never had a beginning, who never came into existence, and that being is God. You know, all of us who are listening this morning have a birth date. You know, September 6, 1945, July 8, 1971. I actually have a birth date or a birthday coming up very shortly, which makes me very sad because since all of the stores are closed, my wife is not going to be able to purchase for me a very nice birthday gift. All of us who are listening this morning have a birth date, but God never had a birth date. You know, this is why Paul could write in 1 Timothy 6.16, who alone has immortality. God alone is immortal. God alone is eternal. Moses writes here, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, of course, implicit within this are certain important truths. And important truth number one is this. God is the creator of all things, which he is. For you see, by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Colossians 1.16. We read in the opening verses of John's gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Important truth number one is God is the creator of all things. Now, important truth number two is God is the sustainer of all things, which again, he is. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Important truth number one is God is the creator of all things. Important truth number two is God is the sustainer of all things. Now, important truth number three is God is in control of all things. Folks, there's not a single speck of dust in the universe that is not under God's control. Let me repeat that. There is not a single speck of dust in the universe that is not under God's control. You know, it's easy to look at world events, including what is taking place with the coronavirus, and to think to yourself, this is utter chaos. But instead, we should be thinking to ourselves, this is consistent with the plan of the eternal, almighty God, who is working all things out for his glory. You know, that's God's ultimate purpose, to maximize his own glory in all things. My glory I will not share with another, Isaiah 42, 8, neither my praise with graven, with graven images. Now, Important truth number four is God is the one. God is the one to whom we are all ultimately accountable. He is the one with whom we all ultimately have to do. The eternality of God. Now, implicit within this psalm, another important reality which this psalm reveals to us is the brevity of life. 
the brevity of life. Look again now with me at verse 3. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are like a yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers. God is eternal, yes, but not man. Notice what Moses says here. Men are like grass. They're like the kind of grass which in the arid climate of the Near East quickly sprang up in the morning, but by nighttime was burned to death by the sun. And then Moses goes on to say in verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. You know, if you take care of yourself, if you work out all the time like Brock does, you pump iron all the time like Brock does, and you eat right, and you don't come down with a major disease, you may live actually past your three score and 10. You may live past 70. You may even live past 80. But at some point, we're all going to die. None of us here gets out of line. Let me repeat that. None of us here gets out, of li gets out alive. And as Moses is talking about here, life is so brief. It is so fleeting. And the things of this life, the things of this world that people live for, that people do everything to get their hands on, like, for example, wealth and popularity and power, it too is all so soon going to be gone, which reminds me of what John wrote in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Along these lines, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass, to, pass away. Folks, it's soon all going to be gone, and very soon we're going to be gone. Stout and strong today, tomorrow turned to clay. This day in his bloom, the next in the tomb. Soon this life is going to end for all of us, and then we're going to stand before the eternal almighty God. Which brings us to the third reality that this glorious psalm reminds us of, and that is the holiness of God. The holiness of God. I'm going to start reading now again with verse 7. For we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath. We are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. For who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. Now, you know, it's important for us to understand the historical context here the historical context behind these words. Moses most certainly was writing this psalm while the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. And why were they wandering in the wilderness? They were wandering in the wilderness because of their rebellious conduct, which we read about in Numbers chapter 14. See, in Numbers 14, we read how the children of Israel refused to enter into the promised land even though they were given the green light by God to do so. And as a result of their rebellion, as a result of their obstinance, God said to his people, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and except for a very few select people, every person of the older generation, 
every individual 20 years old, 20 years of age and up is going to die. So Moses wrote of this psalm while the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and dying in the wilderness, which is why he could say what he says here. For we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath we are terrified, verse 7, for all our days are passed away in your wrath, verse 9. Now the question is, why would God pronounce this sort of judgment upon his Old Testament people? And the answer to that is because God is a God of holiness. In fact, he's more than that. He's a God of impeccable holiness who cannot tolerate even the slightest white lie. So one day we're all going to stand not just before an almighty God, an eternal almighty God, but we're going to stand before a God of impeccable holiness. Now, you know, in light of these things, in light of the eternality of God, and in light of the brevity of life, and in light of the fact that we're all going to one day stand before God, and in light of the holiness of God, how should you and I conduct ourselves? Well, I'll tell you how we should conduct ourselves. First of all, if you're not a believer, you need to be saved. And you can be saved. For you see, God is not just a God of holiness, but he's a God of grace and of mercy and of love. In fact, that's why he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world some 2,000 years ago. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son. And you know, if you trust in him and in him alone, in the Lord Jesus, and in him alone for your salvation, you'll experience the forgiveness of sins. And you'll never have to experience the wrath of an impeccable, holy God. The eternality of God, the brevity of life, the holiness of God, what does that mean for you and I? Well, if you're not saved, it means you need to get saved. And sooner rather than later, boast not of thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. We read in Proverbs 27.1, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. With the coronavirus, with our own lives, we may not have tomorrow. Now is the accepted time. Now is the mm -hmm. time for you to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you are a believer, the eternality of God and the brevity of life and the holiness of God, what this means for you is that you need to start serving. You need to start getting into the word. You know, we read in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You need to start reading and you need to start praying. You need to follow the mandate of 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. And you need to start witnessing. You need to share with individuals the glorious message of the gospel of Christ. The fact that they indeed can escape the eternal wrath of a holy God. None of us here gets out alive. Look, one day you're going to die. And in order for you to escape the wrath, of an impeccable holy God, you need to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to start exercising your gifts within the context of the church with which you are identified. Bottom line, you need to be the type of individual that God would have you be. For once again, at the risk of being repetitive, life at best is very brief, like the binding of a sheaf, like the falling of a leaf. Now, I remember years ago when I was a young man, my mother, I was listening to a conversation that she was having with my father, and she said, Sherwood, that's what she called my dad. My dad's first name was William, but his middle name was Sherwood, and people would ask him, 
why did your mother name you William Sherwood McKay? And he would say, well, as soon as I was born, the doctor said to my mother, wouldn't you like to get rid of this kid? And she said, sure would. And so that's why I was named Sherwood. Anyway, my mother, we call him Sherwood. She said, Sherwood, in 10 years, we're going to see God. She was about 60 at the time. The eternal God, who alone has immortality. The God who is from everlasting to everlasting, who alone is eternal, the holy God, the God of impeccable holiness. Sherwood, in 10 years, mm -hmm. we're going to see God. You may have a little bit longer than 10 years. You may have 20 years, or you may have a little bit less than 10 years. The question is, will you escape the wrath of God for all eternity? And will you be rewarded for your fidelity to the Lord Jesus Christ? Folks, what you're going to take with you to heaven is not your popularity, and not your wealth, and not your power. The only thing that you're going to take to heaven with you, the only thing you're going to be rewarded for, for all eternity, is your faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And if you have been faithful to Christ, you're going to be rewarded with rewards that will blow your mind, that goes beyond anything you could ever begin to start to commence to imagine. We read in Daniel 12:3 that they who turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever and ever. So teach us to number our days, verse 12. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that's what you need to do. Number your days one day, sooner rather than later, you're going to stand before an eternal God who is likewise a God of impeccable holiness. And if you're a believer, you're not going to be judged for your sin, but you're going to be rewarded for your faithfulness. So it's time for me to get at it to a greater degree. It's time for you to get at it to a greater degree. And it's time for all of us to get at it to a greater degree. Thank you for listening. And I think, David, now we're going to have... Uh, a question and answer session.